you pass me the bark? Yeah, for sure. Sweet, thanks. So someone told me the other day that people used to not be able to eat this stuff. Can you believe that? Yeah, apparently when resources for food became scarce back in the day, scientists altered human DNA to allow future generations to actually metabolize cellulose. So basically, we're genetically modified organisms. Wait, what? So am I, am I still human or am I like part beaver? Well, I guess you're in luck because I just learned about that in my microbiology class. Let me explain. Genetically modified organisms are those in which the organism possesses a genetic trait it does not naturally have. It allows selected individual genes to be transferred from one organism into another, even if the species are not related. It all started in the early 1900s when scientists efficiently isolated pure DNA. By the 1970s, scientists were able to recombine DNA. The idea for man-made DNA came from a grad student at Stanford. In 1975, the Silomar Conference was held where a group of biologists, lawyers, and doctors came together to create guidelines for the safe use of genetically engineered DNA. The first GMO patent was issued in 1980 for a GMO that would consume oil spills. This was the first ever patent on a living organism. 1982 was when the FDA approved the first GMO that appeared in the market, human insulin, produced by genetically engineered E. coli bacteria. GMOs were in grocery stores by the mid-90s. They became so popular that labeling for genetically modified products became necessary. Wow, that's fascinating. What did your uh, professor tell you about the process of gene modification? First, you identify the gene of interest. Then you need to isolate the gene. First, start by lysing the cell, which means you break open the DNA so it is exposed. Then precipitate the DNA in order to separate it from the cellular debris. Lastly, purify the gene of interest to isolate the DNA or gene. Next, you amplify the gene through PCR. The plasmid or gene is cut with restriction enzymes. This creates fragments in which DNA ligase is used to seal the nicks in the strand. Then you will have your gene in many copies. Find the correct corresponding promoter and polymerase for your gene. Then multiply the gene from bacteria and recover the gene for injection into the host cell. To transfer the gene to the host cell, which is usually to an unfertilized egg if the organism is growing beyond the cellular level, you may use various techniques, but the main goal is to have the cell accept the transfer gene and not kill the cell. Lastly, just grow the new cell or organism and it should express the gene of interest if you did it correctly and if it isn't rejected by the host. Right. Okay, well that makes sense, but did every scientist agree that it was a good idea to keep producing these organisms? Well... Well, we already got this figured out. Should we go full force with it? I think so. I mean, we've already got this far. Like, we need to just go through with it. I don't know. It's too risky, and we don't know the long-term effects. Well, all I have to say is this is why we need to keep going with production. Eating GMOs is no more dangerous than eating their non-GMO equivalent. GMOs can be engineered to be resistant to pests, such as insects, so it helps to decrease the use of pesticides. GMOs can help to protect and minimize our effects on the environment, and GMOs can help make agriculture more sustainable. But you're not seeing the big picture. These are the reasons why we should go with it. Well, for one, the use of GMOs will cause the use of herbicides to increase greatly, which can possibly be harmful to humans. Also, GMOs engineered to be resistant to pests can end up creating pesticide-resistant insects that will in turn be harder to get rid of. And GMOs can disrupt the biodiversity of our planet. I'm sorry, but I just think the pros outweigh the cons, and I'm going to do it anyways. And the rest is history. I guess they just got really, really out of hand, but hey, at least we can enjoy this nutritious dinner. Oh, definitely. Bark is my favorite food, besides soil, but that's for dessert. Disclaimer, we don't actually know the depths that GMOs can go, as they are still being studied. However, researcher Lisa Dyson gives us insight on what the future could hold for GMOs. Her TED Talk was what influenced our video. She presents the scenario of an astronaut crew in space with the ability to grow crops to feed them for a lengthy amount of time, but only using a few packets of seeds with crops that grow in hours and produce more seeds. 
Dyson was looking for a solution for agriculture at the hands of climate change when she came upon the limited research on hydrogenotrophs. Microbes are a part of the solution because these natural plant eco-recyclers can thrive in a variety of convenient conditions. These specific microorganisms will develop a new type of agriculture that will save the human race by providing the nutrients for food that we are quickly running out of. And Dyson and her team are already in the works of selling products using this revolutionary microorganism. You're in luck again! Guess what's for dessert? I got, I got, I got, I got loyalty, got royalty inside my DNA. Cocaine quarter piece, got war and peace inside my DNA. I got power, poison, pain, and joy inside my DNA. I got hustle, though, ambition flow inside my DNA. I was born like this, and sworn like this, immaculate conception. I transformed like this, performed like this, was Yoshi, one new weapon. I 